Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here and today I want to chat with you guys a little bit about understanding that if our goals are to maximize muscle mass and performance, our diets need to be based around carbohydrates. Uh, and, and I'm not saying there's not an essential need for fats and I'm not saying we don't need high protein. But at the end of the day, most of us who are trying to gain muscle or perform well, uh, our calorie needs are high enough that there's no way to make protein a, a dominant macronutrient anyway. So that shouldn't even be on the table. And I want to get out of the way up front. Um, when I've talked about protein overfeeding, that's usually in the context of trying to use it to, to, as a body fat burning tool. Okay, and I've, I've tried to make that very clear when I've discussed protein overfeeding that there is no evidence whatsoever, none, that exceeding 1 point grams of protein per kilogram of body weight does anything for muscle growth. And I'm talking in strength athletes, bodybuilders. I mean, there's, there's been study after study after study done on this uh, with DEXA scans, muscle biopsies. That is the upper threshold. Okay, that is, seems to be the absolute cap. And so occasionally, you know, when we do bring up the one gram per pound of body weight, people will say, well, that's for a safety net. And I'm like, I've heard evidence-based people say that. And it's like, but that's not a safety net. The safety net is the, the 1.6 grams, which is around 0.8, approximately 0.8 grams per pound of body weight. That is the, the upper threshold, so that is the safety cap. Because keep in mind, that is the, the most extreme. It doesn't mean that everyone even needs to hit that. It's just that no one benefits in terms of muscle growth beyond that. And this is assuming a mixed protein diet you know, that you have a variety of uh, protein qualities. Uh, the optimal range is really something from about one gram up to about 1.6. That's the upper threshold. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with eating more than that. It's actually quite easy. For those of us who enjoy protein foods, it's really easy for me to sometimes double that without even thinking about it. If I'm just eating a lot of lean meat and have it handy, I mean, I'll exceed that number. But the point is, uh, there, there's no muscle growth benefits beyond that. There can be some other metabolic benefits. There can be some benefits for some fat burning, possible connective tissue, healing, things like that. Right? Injury recovery, recovery from surgeries. Yeah, those things, absolutely. But when we are talking purely muscle growth, those are the upper thresholds. And it's not about how much is used to build muscle. Okay, because that's only like a gram or two a day. We're talking about muscle protein synthesis and net growth as a result of it. Uh, so that's the thing to think about. Number two, we come over to fat. Fat can provide calories. It can provide energy when it rests and, and, low, and, and other things. Uh, fat is useful when you cannot force down enough calories for someone who's trying to gain weight, for example, or to even maintain weight, right? That makes sense because we can use it as an energy dense fuel source. But in terms of its actual contribution to anything anabolic, it has it has no value. People say, what? It doesn't positively impact your anabolic hormones when compared to carbohydrates. It is it is inferior. It's inferior to both carbohydrate and protein for that. Um, and people have this bizarre notion that they're gonna get the most testosterone levels as if small fluctuations in the, in the normal range have any benefit for muscle growth. They don't, Hint, they don't. The reason people use super, super physiological amounts, that's when it starts to matter. Minor fluctuations in the normal range do not even register on, on the muscle growth point, but also your body can make testosterone in the absence of, of dietary fat. That's not really uh, part of the situation. Not to the degree that you would think it would be, at least not chronically. So in terms of anabolic hormones, it, it, it does nothing for IGF-1, nothing for insulin. Then we come over and we can't even use it for training fuel for high intensity training. Okay, So really the only storage component of, of uh, fat intake is to store your body fat stores. Okay, that's the, the and it provides an energy source. And it's not, a, it's not an energy source that your body prefers to use. It will prefer to store it given the choice. All right, so that being said, what does that leave us? Carbohydrate. All right, 
what are what are our perks here? Why why does this matter? Number one, it's it's our training field for hall high intensity activity, and it can still be used. It's diverse. In other words, only really low intensity activity, uh, aerobic activity can burn fat, but anaerobic and aerobic activity both can use carbohydrate. Okay, so we need to be clear on that point. It is. A more diverse fuel source and it is the only fuel source we're going to use for, for really intense training so if you're doing really really high volumes of training trying to stimulate muscle growth and all that great um, number two and again that's important for insulin sensitivity because people worry about insulin insulin is, is way more anabolic to muscle tissue than it is to fat tissue and I'm not telling people they need to be insulin resistant but eating insulinogenic foods when you have a high insulin sensitivity in your muscle tissue is extremely anabolic. It absolutely impacts muscle growth. It absolutely impacts recovery. Uh, and this is this is not really subject to debate. Okay, anabolic is one of the most uh, insulin is one of the most anabolic hormones, flat hot, and it shuttles nutrients into your, into your muscle tissue. And again, contrary to other beliefs, no insulin in the normal ranges for people who are metabolically healthy is not a fat storage hormone. It really isn't. It's not going to shuttle nutrients into your fat tissue. It will shuttle nutrients into your muscle tissue. Okay? The only argument people make is that it could blunt the fat burning response, but if you're eating carbohydrates and you're not on a specific cut, are you that worried about fat burning being blunted? Like, do you care? There's a reason it's blunting. It's because you can use carbohydrate now and you're eating carbohydrate. So that, that makes sense to be burning carbohydrate. So that again, you can use it for the other activity. But the, the anabolic response, it produces the largest hormonal response and cascade of hormonal responses in the body that build muscle tissue, that fuel performance. Okay, you have that and then on top of that, what is insulin and carbohydrate associated with hormonally? Lowering SHBG. So all these people talk about free testosterone, uh, carbohydrates. And when I say carbohydrates, again, I want to be clear, we're talking about glucose-based short carbohydrates. I'm not telling you that consuming a bunch of, of refined fructose is what you should be doing because that's not really the carbohydrate we're looking for. We are looking for glucose. And fruit and other foods like that, the, most of the, the fructose in those gets converted to glucose by your gut flora. The refined sugars, it doesn't. So as long as it ends up as glucose, we're still okay, right? We're still okay. But I wanna clarify that point because every time this comes up, people start saying, you're saying I should consume table sugar. No, no one said that, you dumbass. Stop being a fucking idiot. <laughs> all right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I'll talk to you guys next time.